I've got two words for you. Swarm robots. If you're a fan of science in real life, you know we talk a lot about biology. But when I found out about this swarm robotics lab at Harvard, I knew we needed to make an episode with them. So we're switching it up. Robot swarms are awesome because instead of having one super complicated robot carry out a task, you can program a ton of simple robots to do the same thing. The robots that make up the swarm are relatively easy to design and build, and if a couple of them malfunction or get damaged along the way, the group can still get the job done. In order to design a great swarm of robots, our super special guests take inspiration from swarms in real life. And where do they find those? Bugs, fish, birds, in other words, biology. Okay, this episode isn't actually that different from the others. Welcome back to Science in Real Life. I'm Molly and I'm here with our super special guests, Radhika Nagpal and Melinda Malley. Radhika is a professor in the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences at Harvard University and Melinda is a PhD student in Radhika's lab. Hi. Hi. Radhika and Melinda study and design swarm robots, and the inspiration for their work comes from the natural world. So can you tell us a little bit about your current swarm inspiration? swarm inspiration? Sure. Our group takes inspiration from many different kinds of biological swarms. Schools of fish, termite and ant colonies, even beavers that build. And today, Melinda is going to tell you about our work where we take inspiration from army ants. Army ants do these really cool group behaviors where they'll actually build structures out of themselves in order to cover gaps in their path. And they actually have to move around every few days to follow their food and their prey. So they'll build their whole nest out of their bodies <laughs> and then reconstruct it every few days in order to follow the prey. Wow, that's pretty amazing. So if we could build robots that could do the kinds of things army ants do, climb over each other, construct structures, then there's just all kinds of robotics applications we could think of. So we could put robots in really harsh terrains, in deserts, with dunes, or somewhere where we need to fix the environment, or even on Mars, and then they could help each other get through complex terrain, maybe even shore up a collapsing structure by building supporting structures out of their bodies. So if we could do all of those things, it would just be totally amazing. Right, so it's one thing to see these incredible behaviors in nature and think like, yeah, I should totally make a robot that does that. But what's the actual process of designing and programming a robot swarm? Well, Melinda's gonna show you how it's done. All right, let's go do some robot science in real life. So when you're designing a robot swarm, you've got two different components, right? Hardware and then software. So hardware is going to be the physical body of the robot, and then software is the computer programming. We don't want to just go ahead and like program a whole swarm, because that's going to be pretty complicated. <laughs> so instead, we're going to first try to test it in simulation, figure out what we want that programming to be first, so that we can do these same ant building behaviors. Wait, so how do you translate ant behavior into computer code? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, biologists, they're still really figuring this out. What exactly are the rules that these ants follow in order to do the bridge building? So what we think is going on, what biologists think is going on, is if I'm an ant, I'm going along my path, and if suddenly another ant steps on me, then I might want to stay still. Maybe I should become part of a structure. If a lot of ants are stepping on me, then probably I'm a pretty important part of the structure. I should stay there, be a stepping stone for other ants. Okay, so you program your simulated robot swarm with that rule. Like if I am getting stepped on by another robot, I stay still. And then you see if that rule is enough for the swarm to build a bridge. Yeah, exactly. So we'll actually do that here. We're gonna run a simulation. So this V represents a difficult terrain that we want our robots to build a bridge over. The simulation keeps adding new robots that need to cross the terrain. So you can see the first robots descend into the V. They've created a traffic jam and other robots are starting to climb over them. The ones at the bottom are starting to turn a lighter teal, which means that they sense that they're being stepped on and then they know to stop moving. So, in other words, they're following the rule. And as more robots are stepped on and stop moving, we see a bridge start to form, and the following robots are able to climb across the V much more quickly. 
So now we know that when we give a simulated swarm this rule, the robots build this bridge on their own. So one thing that stands out to me is that you know, you're not sitting here like controlling the actions of every single robot in the swarm. You give them these set of rules and then you kind of stand back and let them do their thing. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. So we really want to be able to send these robots out into the real world and be able have them be able to function as an independent group without any sort of central command telling them what to do. <laughs> That's incredible. So when is it time to start designing and building the actual robots? So the simulation and the design of the robot really go hand in hand. Our hardware is going to inform our simulation, then our simulation also informs our hardware. So you tweak one, then you go back and tweak the other. Exactly, back and, forth. Okay. back and forth. For example, they have to actually be able to climb on top <laughs> right, of each right. other, right? So we did a bunch of brainstorming and then looked at nature to try and figure out how are we going to come up with a design well, ants seem to be pretty good at climbing on top of each other without getting stuck. Uh, you're right, they <laughs> totally are. Unfortunately, they also have six legs. That means for a robot, that means a lot of complex moving uh -huh. parts. So what we did is we actually turned to another biological inspiration, and that's soft-bodied insects like caterpillars. <laughs> So since they're soft and compliant, caterpillars can sort of climb over whatever structure is in front of them, right? Whether it's a weird tree branch or another caterpillar. So we really wanted to do something like that for our robot. So uh, can we see the robots now? Oh yeah. So this is our robot. Um, sort of looks a little bit like a worm or a caterpillar. Yeah, yeah. And it's got these uh, corkscrew grippers on each side. So the robot terrain is made of Velcro. There's a little motor um, on the back there that's controlling that. So it winds them into the Velcro and then to detach it can wind them out. And then to control how it moves, so I have a motor in this little section right here that's connected to a cable. So it might be a little bit easier, we can show it with the old robot. Uh -huh. So when you wind it, it winds the cable, <laughs> shortens the cable, and then it can oh flip over. So then this end would find the ground, mm -hmm. attaches to the ground. With or, the corkscrew. Yeah, with okay. the corkscrew. Attached there, it can mm -hmm. detach here, mm -hmm. and then it flips over. You imagine there's a cable now on this oh side too. Yeah. And ah. flip over to the other so side. So just like, do not, yep. do not, and that's how it gets around. Yep. Wow. There's also an IR sensor on each gripper, and that just lets the robot know, okay, I've made contact with something, another robot, or mm -hmm. a surface. And it's time to grip. Yep, okay. exactly. Each of these boards, that's how we uh, program a robot. You just plug it into the computer, send the program, and then this will control all, all of uh, you know, the motors and get input from the sensors and tell it what it needs to do. So this is the part that's helping it follow the rules that exactly, we Exactly, yeah. All right, so we're going to see whether our robot is moving correctly. It's programmed to activate its corkscrew grippers when it senses a surface. Then the other end unscrews from the surface and the motor activates to wind the cable and allow the robot to flip over to a new part of the terrain. So we've put this fake robot body in here to see if the robot can climb over another robot, since that will be an essential part of building a bridge. It's doing great right now, but it's definitely taken a while to get to this step. So right now we know our rules work in simulation, and the physical robot can climb over other robots. In future experiments, we'll replace this fake robot with a real one, see if it can sense if another robot is on top of it, and program it to stop moving when it does. Melinda, it was incredible to see this process of designing and building your robot. Uh, so eventually you'll have a lot of them and can see how they function in a swarm? Yeah, so that's the idea. We'll have a whole group of them and then we can test these behaviors, run experiments, and really try to determine what is it that allows robots to form structures. We obviously want to be able to make robots that have capabilities like army ants that are just able to climb and are able to create structures. And that's of course one part of this. But we also hope that in the process of doing these experiments, we'll understand more about army ants themselves. So what do army ants need to know about their fellow mates in order to create these kind of structures? How much intelligence does an individual need? 
And so, you know, the fun part is we obviously use biology to inspire our robots, but we also hope that our robots are going to help us better understand the natural world. Ah, well said. Well, if you'd like to know more about the Nagpal Labs swarms and see some in action, you should definitely check out the links to their lab website and YouTube channel. They're in the description. Uh, thank you guys so much for being on the show. And don't forget to subscribe to Science in Real Life. We'll see you next time.